So this is uh, Sue's one year tribute talk and it is just so fucking hard without here. I can see the hurt and pain that John, Jasmine and Tom go through. I don't know that Tom, you know, stands up tall as a soldier and, 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 and you know, he tries not to let it get to him or, you know, he, he won't show the emotion and all the rest of it. But, it, you know, you, I can see the pain in his eyes. I can see that, you know, it, it gets very hard for him to talk about Sue um, sometimes, you know, that, um, you know, he always tries to distract himself from the pain. You know, but it still hurts. And I know that every time John and Jasmine bring up Sue around Tom, like, I, I know, I can see it hurts. You know, and John, you know, he, he, um, he has breakdowns about it, you know. I mean, you try your hardest, don't you? You know, like, e even Jasmine, she tries her hardest. They, they, they all do. You know, J Jasmine's in the cottage and she, you know, she'll be crying, and just breaking down and letting it in. She says, I miss mum so much. And it's not right what happened. Sue didn't deserve to die. And her kids and even Tom don't deserve to be going through this pain. Not in a million years did I ever think that this was going to happen to Sue, though. It's 2.54 and it's exactly the 18th to the day. And I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about what were we doing right now at 2.54? We're all at the hospital, I'm pretty sure. We're all at the hospital. I remember when me and Jasmine rocked up to the hospital first, uh, before Tom and John. Um, Sue was trying to pull the mask off and trying to say something to Jasmine, and and and, and the doctor came in and, and just uh, stopped her from doing that, you know, because she's on, you know, she's on the mask for a reason to help her breathe and stuff. But yeah, you know, it's like every every minute to every hour that that clock ticked, you know, it's just, she wasn't getting any better. All we, all we were doing was just sitting there and watching her vitals drop bit by bit. You know, I just watch her struggle even more for her body, you know, and, and, and that's the thing, Sue never gave up. She never gave up on us, she never gave up on herself. It was her body that let her down in the end. You know, and the fact that she was able to last night, you know, um, a, one year ago, last night, was able to still be somewhat lucid enough to have um, somewhat of a conversation with us, you know, and I always remember that when I walked up there, you know, well, even before that, you know, that phone call, that dreaded fucking phone call, you know, the whole day, it was just like, sort of, like, touch and go, like, you didn't know what information you were going to get next from Tom. And I remember, I saw, I saw Sue's Toyota CHR, I saw Sue's car leave the property, and I, I, I could make out that it was Tom and Sue, Tom was driving and Sue was in the front passenger seat, and about a minute later they came back because they must have forgot something and then they left, and I remember, um, oh god, ah oh, fuck, okay this, oh this hurts, oh, anyway, um, I remember seeing Sue, um, oh yeah, that's all. that's right, because I saw her walk out of the main house as well. But the, I can't, I'm going to keep backtracking here, because I am going to go through everything um, that I backtrack on. But the night before too, like, she had three hours, three hours holding Rosie Uninterrupted, she didn't get up to go to the toilet, she didn't get up to, to do anything. Just three hours where she was holding Rosie. And that's got to be, you know, contributed to how much pain that she was also going through as well. Because Sue was somebody who was always running backwards and forwards from the toilet all the time. And the fact that she had that special three hours or so, me and John, we were in the um, we were in Tom's land room and we were watching YouTube videos and we did not interrupt her or disturb her or nothing. And she had that three hours. That was the last time that I saw Sue with my own eyes somewhat healthy or, you know, I, I wouldn't say healthy. I would say normal, you know, in, in terms of things just felt normal in that moment. You know, everything felt right. And even that town and country, I know that Sue was um, off. She was, she was acting off. And even in the town and country video, 
you know, when you get those little glimpses of Sue in the background, she just didn't look right. She wasn't eating. She didn't have an appetite, really. She looked very, you know, um, just very down. And, and, you know, she was sort of slumped down a bit. And, and she just didn't look right, you know. But, like, when she had that three hours on the couch with Rosie, it was like, that's the way things should have stayed. You know, honestly, that's the way things should have stayed. Things should have stayed like that. Like, it should have been like that, you know. It should still be like that, even now. It should be, we go over for family dinner night, and Sue still gets to hold Rosie for as long as she wants. We all sit down and watch a movie, you know, we have a good dinner. We all have a chat, and, and you know, it was so interesting hearing how... You know, Sue would tell me what different ingredients that she's, uh, you know, how she implemented and how she would cook and everything, right? I was so interested when we'd sit down, and that was something that Sue was doing a lot too, right? It was, you know, letting, like, telling us all, like, what ingredients and how she put things together and everything. And even, even for my birthday, um, you know, Sue was telling me how she put the lasagna together and everything. I was always interested to hear about, um, you know, Sue's cooking and how she'd put things together because it was very interesting. I found it very fascinating. You know, how she was such an amazing master chef cook. And then, um, after seeing that, Sue, that last time, because for me it was, um, and I know even for Jasmine, it was, we saw Sue, Jasmine went to the cottage after that, and the next time that me and Jasmine saw Sue was when she was in the hospital, and it was just, and it, that, that was like a real big, you know, shot to the fucking heart right there and then I saw Sue coming out of the main house um, and when she left with Tom and they came back and they must have forgot something and then they left and I saw CHR um, for the last time that day um, you know John came over a little bit after they left and told us that um, you know that his mum wasn't going you know, it was really sickly and, and everything and, you know, letting us know everything and that Tom was, to, you know, driving her to the doctors and, yeah, you know, every time John got some information from his dad, he always let us know. He always came over straight away and I know, uh, you know, John said he was having some drinks that day as well because he was starting to get, you know, down about his mum's health, which is understandable and I know that Jasmine was worried the whole fucking day too. You know, she was she was worried the whole day as well. Um, you know, so it's like over in the main house, you had Johnny was drinking, was really worried and starting to get depressed about his mum's health. And then you have Jasmine that was, you know, she wasn't drinking, but she was just very down and she was very just like fidgety, Jasmine was. You know, she just couldn't sit still. She was always, you know, checking her phone to see if her dad sent her a message or messenger or, or you know, there's any updates and stuff, you know. And every time she got a call from Tom you know, it was always like you were hoping that it was just like, oh, you know, um, Jasmine was just hoping that Tom was going to say, like her dad was going to say to her, you know, mum's um, not travelling too well, but she's going to be administered in a hospital. And, you know, it's like, I, you know, me and Jasmine were just thinking there was just another one of those things that she'd just probably be in a hospital for another two weeks or something, you know. That would have been a lot better than what we ended up with, than what actually happened, Sue dying... We would rather have just been in a hospital for two weeks, you know, if she had to be put on more medications or if they had to, you know, um, pump the fluids or something, you know, too much um, fluid build up again or something, you know, or, or, or if it was, um, look, I, you know, and I know this sounds terrible, but even if they had to, like, amputate one of her legs or something like that, right? Like, I'm just saying, that would have been a lot better than her dying. You know, we still would have had her here. She still would have been alive. You know, she was so lively all the time. She was, there was always that, you know, presence about her whenever you walked into the main house and she would always say, oh, hello. You should say, oh, uh, you know, hello, uh, darling, or, you know, hello. Just, that, just every time she had that bright smile on her face and she was always happy to have a conversation with anybody, you know. And John knew every time he walked out, of his bedroom, you know, his mum would always offer him something to eat or, you know, offer to go out or go shopping. Like, John loved and enjoyed those days that he got with, with his mum, you know, and it was so lucky, too, that um, Tom got that Tasmania trip with her, 
just just them two and Jasmine also having that um one last mother daughter's day you know and going to the uh Swep center you know the Bendigo stadium for dinner and you know them having some games on the slot machine on the pokies machine and stuff you know and I know that Jasmine generally she did it you know they both enjoyed themselves thoroughly enjoyed themselves because you know Jasmine, um, before she had that, you know, before she left, and, and the thing is, it wasn't planned either. It's just, um, I, I don't know whether Jasmine's, I, I think Jasmine said, I'm not too sure um, whose idea it was. But Jasmine just turned around to me and she said to me, I'm going out and um, I'm having a mother-daughter's day with uh, mum. And I said, go for it. I said, I hope you and your mum enjoy yourself, really. You know, and I stayed home with Rosie and I, you know, they went out. And they, they generally did. And Jasmine came back and she had this real positive glow about her, like she really did enjoy herself. And then, um, you know, and every time John would go out with his mum and stuff, like John would even walk around and, and, and have this glow about himself. Like, you know, glow is in terms of, like, you know, you could tell when somebody was generally happy. You know, they were generally happy. There wasn't really that much of a worry in their life at all, you know, because everything was good. Everything was how it was supposed to be. You know, there was me, Jasmine, John, Tom, Rosie, and Sue. That was the family. That's the way it was supposed to stay. And now, you, you know, it's all like doom and gloom all the time. You know, like, it just does not feel the same. Like, you feel like this huge positive energy has just been sucked from the family. It's just been sucked from the property. And Jasmine balls down and, you know, and starts crying and, and really gets, you know just really gets emotional and I, I, I and I lean over and I put my arms around her and I give her a hug and I try and let her know, you know, I'm 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 here for her and, and, and everything, you know. And how much we both miss her mum and then, you know, even with John. You know, I, I know John and Tom, you know, they, they, they have their moments where they break down and in, in, in private, you know. Uh you know, it doesn't matter if it was Tom, Jasmine, or John, right? Like, that pain, and if I see them break down in front of me, I, you know, they should never be ashamed for it. They should never feel ashamed about it. They should never feel embarrassed. You know, I'm here, and of course I'll give them a hug, because it fucking hurts. It hurts me too, you know? And just... It's 3.05, we were still at the hospital. One year ago. <sighs> Nothing's ever been the same since. No matter how positive you try and be about something, no matter how, how much you, know, you can try and get in the mood and be happy, you just know that there is this big, huge portion that's just missing. This positive energy portion of the family is just missing. We're at the hospital and, yeah, and I, I remember the phone call too. That was the worst phone call you could ever get. John came over later on in the night. You know, me, me and Jasmine were ready to go to bed. And the only reason why me and Jasmine were ready to go to the bed is because, like, we, you know, we were under that impression that um, Sue was only going to be in a hospital, like, you know, for a week or two, like she was, like, a month or so later. Uh, sorry, um, earlier, I should say, earlier. You know, like, I don't know the correct time frames on things like John does. He knows all that. I don't. So I'm just trying to go off the top of my head. But, um, because, you know, I, I, I just, I'm very bad in that terms of things. But we went there and, um, yeah, we were about to go to, we were about to go to bed. And John, um, knocks on the, on the back door of the cottage and, um, he, no, that's right. I was out having a smoke. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. We, were, we yeah, me and Jasmine were, were like Jasmine was already in bed. And I think we we're gonna watch a movie or something. And um, you know, because you're hoping for you know you go to sleep, wake up, and there's more positive news that you know we can go to the hospital and just visit her because she's just been put in there because she's just you know fluid build up or whatever it is, right? Never ever ever thought it was gonna be that. Never ever thought that he'd get that phone call, and that's right. I was out having a smoke, 
and um, um, after the smoke, I was just going to go to bed with Jasmine. And John came over and he said, um, have you heard anything from Dad? Have you heard any more from Dad? And I'm like, no. No, we haven't heard anything from your Dad um, not since last time, John. Not since a couple of hours ago. Last thing we heard was that um, they're still waiting. Or something like that. Or well, not still waiting, but Sue was in there having, um, like, you know, getting checks, vital checks, and all the rest of it. Right. That's right. Um. And then that gut wrenching moment that I remember. Me and John were outside talking. I was finishing off my smoke, and um, I heard Jasmine. She just was very loud, very vocal. And she came out and she said, no. You know, she said, no, please don't. Like, don't tell me no. And John, um, John uh, walked past me and opened the uh, sliding door more and walked into the cottage. And, um, you know, he's like, what? And he's like, no, mummy, what? You know, what, what, what's going on? No. Like, and I saw John's demeanor change. I could see Jasmine was in tears and then John started... Um, like, I think Jasmine turned around and said, Dad just said that, um, Mum's gonna die. Or something along the lines of that. And that John started breaking down, and I was just standing there, and all I could think was... What? Like, in my head, I was just thinking, what? I'm like, no, what? This isn't right. What, what, what the fuck? She's, she's gonna, she's gonna die, or she's dying. What? What the fuck? I'm, I'm just thinking in my head, like, in this moment, I'm like, no, this, like, you know, and the thing is, you know, you, you're just waiting for, for you know, everyone to sort of, like, look at you and then start smiling and laughing and saying, ha-ha, we got you sort of thing, you know? Like, you, of course, you don't want anybody to ever make a sick joke like that, but you would rather that, you like, in my head, I'm just thinking, like, when, okay... Like, and you're waiting. I'm waiting for everyone's demeanor to change. I'm waiting for, you know, everyone to sort of stop crying and, and tell me that it's not real. Because, you know, the first, like, 30 seconds or so, it's like blatant denial. You're like, what? The no, that's bullshit. She's not dying. Come on. Like, that's... You, you, you're kidding, right? You're, you're, only, you're only joking. Like, it's a fucked up joke, but you, you're only kidding, right? And then you realize very quickly... People's demeanor, the change, the, the, the faces, the expressions, it's not changing. This is really like, what? No, 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 this is not real, no. Just bullshit. And then Tom said over the phone, yeah, you guys need to come up to the hospital, get in the car straight away and just come to the hospital straight away because it's going to be the last time you, the only time you have to say goodbye. It's like, no. No, this is, this is bullshit. Like, what? And we got got in the car and went to the hospital and... It's just so daunting, you know? And Jasmine came back from seeing her mum and, you know, because it was one of the time because of the bullshit COVID crap going on at the time. And Jasmine said, it does not look like mum. Like, you, you know it's mum, but she looks so sick. She looks really sick. Like somebody's sucking the life out of her. She says, you know, you're not pre you're not going to be prepared to, to see it, you know. And you walk up there and I, when I walked up there with Rosie and I saw what state Sue is in, I'm like, oh, jeez. This is really fucking bad. You know, and, and, and as soon as I walked up there with Rosie, Sue just formed breast, you know, just. It's like Rosie gave her, like, like this, this um, breath of new life sort of thing. She, you know, just like sprouted up and was you know, started smiling. Was so happy to see Rosie and everything. And she was holding a conversation with me, you know, um, like an actual decent conversation. You know, she wasn't like all out of it or anything. You know, she was able to understand and pick up on what I was saying, and it was so happy, you know, to see Rosie. It's, it's fucking. So sad. It should, shouldn't be like this. It's just so horrible. And the fact that sepsis, you know, it's like it's worse than cancer because with Sue it was like forty-eight hours, or even less. You know, and it's like 
with sepsis, it's like your whole body just hates you because it tries to fight off the infection, but it ends up, <clears throat> you know, shutting down all your organs and everything. Yeah, sepsis is really, really, really bad. Cancer it can take six months, twelve months, or even longer. You know, it's a slow onset. But with with sepsis, it's so quick. If you don't get it like practically straight away, then it's going to kill you. And it's sitting there and looking and watching those those vitals of Sue go down. You know, and and when they took the mask off, it's like I, I knew what they were doing. You knew what was going on. Like you knew as soon as that mask came off, she just yeah. There's no way she's going to be able to breathe on her own. It was too far gone. And when we got to the hospital, you know, and, and at that point, um, when they, um, when they, when they, uh, when we all, you know, when they dragged us into the room and they, that when they said to us that, um, that was practically the point of no return, essentially, like, that's when they told us that she was going to die. And the only thing that we can do now is just be around her in her final hours. Like, I know it was the machine that was doing it for her, all the medications, everything they were pumping into her body, um, you know, and, and the mask. You know, I know it was the machine that, that was keeping her alive, but if they had kept her on the machine, it would have been, um, she probably would have still been, like, the vitals still would have been going probably in the early hours of the morning, but, you know, it's like that thing of, was it better for them to take the mask off or was it not? Like, was it inhumane to just let her die slowly or was it more inhumane to take the mask off and let her die quickly? Like, you know, I shut all the machines off and the vitals and everything. After we got out of that room, it's like... we it, That was like that 100% you knew she was dying. You know, um, and even now, you know, when you look at the Bendigo Hospital and everything, you know, and you look up and you know that she was in that ICU room. And the thing is, you know, you just wish, you just wish that, the, that there was this thing of the hospital just took her, like she was just sleeping, you know, and that the hospital just took her and that you're going to be able to see her again. But it's not that at all, and you can't go fooling yourself into that because I feel like then you start getting yourself into a real dark place in your mind, you know. But the fact is, the only the only part, the the closest you're ever going to get to a physical form of Sue ever again is that urn, is her ashes, you know. And Jasmine, you know, several times has. Yeah, t uh, taken Sue's urn and um, sat on the couch and just cried and held her and, and, and talked to her mum, you know? And, you know, when you look at that urn, you just can't believe Sue's in there. You say, no, it, sh it shouldn't have happened to a beautiful woman like that. Somebody like Sue, it shouldn't have happened. No, she should still be here. Things should be normal. And the fact that the property feels like it's been sucked out of you know, positivity of life and all the rest of it after Sue died, it's not right. You know, that the, all the hurt, all the pain, and, and, and just remembering that one year ago on this day, where we were, what we were doing, we were at the hospital, you know, um... And me and Jasmine got there first, and Sue was a uh, little bit more lucid as in terms of wanting to say something to Jasmine, but the doctor just wouldn't allow her to take the mask off. And, of course, you wouldn't take the mask off at that point. But, you know, just just hoping, hoping for a miracle, hoping for anything, you know, hoping that, you know, suddenly, like, miraculously, her, um, you know, the toxicity levels in her body would go down and, and then suddenly she would start getting better, you know? That the sepsis would, would, would go away or, or something, you know? Like, it doesn't work like that, but, like, just just to be able to look at that, those, you know, just wanted to look at those monitors and see the vitals start to pick up more and more, you know, and, and start to see that, you know, she was just making this big, you know, bounce back 
from all that, but it was never going to happen. You know, and it's just, yeah, things are just not the same, nowhere near the same, they never will be. You know, Tom, Tom works and, you know, tries to distract himself from it all, which nobody can blame him. Jasmine tries to, you know, find positive distractions for it because, you know, and I know John, John tries as well, like we, we all do, you know, um, it just hurts so fucking much. And the thing is, you know, people say over time, the more years pass, you'll get used to it. You never do though. You never get used to it. You never be okay with it. You'll never like accept it because it's something that should have never happened you know and you know you, you can go backwards and forwards in your mind and you can say I you know I should have done this differently or I should have done that or you know I, I, this is what they the doctors should have done or this at the hospital or whatever you know and the thing is but it's never going to change it unfortunately it never will fucking change it and that's what hurts the most about it too is the fact that you wish that you could just get in some magical time machine and go back and and make it all okay you know and and do things differently but the thing is no one person is to blame not one person is to blame for it not even sue's to blame for why she died it wasn't her fault it was the sepsis and it was the fact that well the sudden onset of sepsis and also the fact that um, her body gave up on her. And even when she was sitting, I think uh, I was thinking it was a Saturday or something. Um, I think, or, or one of the days anyway, as I said, I'm not too clear on it, 100%. But that day that she uh, said that she had not sitting on the bed the whole day and said she had an overactive bladder. And, and that was also a day that John um, got Sue to send me a voice message too uh, through John's messenger account. And I, I, and I never got voice messages from Sue. And that was something you know, um, different, you know, but I liked it though, I liked the fact that John got his mum to send me a voice message, you know, and then, like her just saying that she's got the overactive bladder, when really, it was not overreactive, she, you know, it gave off the impression that she was going to the toilet too much, when really she wasn't, she wasn't going to going to the toilet at all, she was just sitting on the bed the whole day, and that was, you know, from, from John and Tom's perspective, would have been really odd, would have been really off. It's like, why is mum sitting on the bed the whole day? She's not moving. She's just on the bed. You know, and, and it's like... That would have been the point to take her to the hospital and she would have survived, most likely. Or would have had a better chance at surviving, anyway. And the thing is, you can never change it. But... And you've you got to make the most of life. The best advice I can say from all this heartache, all this hurt and pain, from me to Tom, Jasmine, and John, you know, like, from all of us, the best advice that I can give is, and I know it doesn't, it doesn't ever take away the hurt. It never takes away the hurt, it never takes away the pain, it never makes it okay of what's happened. But the best advice I can give is, live each day in your mother's honour. You know? Keep making her proud and you know that if she was still here, she'd be proud of every single one of us and she still is, you know? Whether you want to believe in that she's somewhere or that you don't believe in it or whatever your beliefs are, right? It's like, you know that she would be proud of us, every single one of us, though. You know, I know that she was proud of the fact that that she, you know, I, and it may have only been like six or seven months or however long it was, right, that she got with Rosie. It was not much time at all. But she still got to witness the birth of her first grandchild. She still got to spend time with Rosie, you know, and she she, she um, still got all that. She's, you know, they were still fortunate, very fortunate that she got that. Even though it wasn't much time at all. And um, I know that she was proud of how far me and Jasmine came with our relationship. The fact that we had a beautiful daughter, a beautiful daughter in in Rosie, you know, and um, that she was proud of of me and Jasmine starting a little family, you know, with, with Rosie. And I know that she was proud of John too, because you know her and John were very close. 
very close. John's, uh, you, you know, was a mummy's boy and, and always, you know, she's proud of the fact that she could go out and do things with John and, and have that time with him, you know, and just, um, and she was always proud of Tom too because of his work ethic and, you know, everything he did and just the type of husband that he was, you know. Like, Sue held family as the most important thing in her heart. And that's what is important. And Sue is so right with that. The family is the most important thing in life. You know? And you can't go around um, taking advantage of it. And I learned that myself. That when you have a family that's as close as this, when you have a family that's like this, you never want to take advantage of it because it's so special. You know, and just Sue, every birthday, every Christmas, she was the life of the party. You know, Sue was. She was the one that always, like every Christmas, would always go out Christmas shopping, got so excited about it, was so happy to decorate the house and, you know, decorate the table and kick cook all that really nice Christmas food and then sit there and enjoy it with family, you know? And even birthdays. Sue even did the same thing with birthdays. She went out and she'd get all these decorations and get everything and, you know, do cooking for it. And, you know, like Jasmine's 22nd birthday. Like the key videos on this YouTube channel, um, you know, what to do with Sue is, um, you know, definitely Sue's 20, uh, sorry, Sue's 62nd birthday was very, very special. It was very special, that video. The Town and Country, the last video that Sue was in, even though that she was very weak and lethargic, was very, you know, looked very like down, and you could tell, you know, she was just something wasn't right. But still, that was special. Jasmine's twenty second birthday, right? You know, you see Sue in the background, and she was enjoying herself. She generally had a really good time. Or even you know the videos of um, Rosie's baby shower, um, or even Bo uh, Rosie's uh, gender reveal. You know, and Sue was still in all these videos, and she may have just been in the background of it all, except for the 60 second, that was key, focused on her, because it was her birthday, but little did we know that was going to be the last birthday that she would ever have, you know? And it was made so special too, you know? From things like Jasmine's 22nd birthday, where Sue got Jasmine that very sentimental gift of um, the necklace to the blanket, to, um, you know, Sue's 62nd birthday and the very special gift that Jasmine got her in, in terms of, you know, that, that uh, picture, like, that was so sentimental. And we keep to that. And, 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 you know, I know that there's those plans to even add to that picture, right? To get Sue put in that picture. Because, as a special it is, to get the same picture done, but add Sue to it with her parents and Rosie. You know, but I think in this one, uh, the, the like the redo of it, um, if that's to go ahead, I I would think it, it, that Sue should be holding Rosie, but Rosie now, you know, would be very special. You know, would be very special, very sentimental gift. I could just see how much Sue really loved that picture that Jasmine got her for her 62nd birthday, and it's. You know, we're, we're all trying to cope with the pain, but it just never goes away and it never will. But just from what I say from my perspective and even, you know, what I see is Sue was just... They say that the perfect mum never exists. Well, Sue was the perfect mum, hands down. She always did things for her kids without fail, without question, Right? Sue wouldn't have to be asked. She'd just do it automatically. She was always there for her kids. All the time. And no matter what, you know, even when John and Jasmine were on different you know, sides of the page and they, the, you know, they were having their falling outs, you know, um, Sue never picked one, one of her kids over the other. She never did. Her kids were equal to her. She loved them both the same and equally. And when I came in the picture of things, I know that there was a bumpy road between me and Sue because of the stuff that I was doing was not right. But 
that last, I would say in that last year that she had, me and Sue got really close. You know? And even closer when Rosie was born. She couldn't stop praising me about how proud of a father, how proud of a mother that she is of me and Jasmine. You know, and, and I know that she had this glow in her eyes when she laid her eyes on Rosie the first time. I know that she was happy that John was an uncle. You know? She was proud of John as an uncle and proud of Tom for, as being a grandfather, you know? Like, that they finally got their uh, grandchild. And I know that Sue was also very happy that she got a granddaughter. You know, I know that she would have been happy with a grandson or a granddaughter, but the fact that, it was a, that Rosie, you know, was a granddaughter, it was just so special to her, you know? And, and family is everything. And Sue was really that beak of the light that, that, that showed me, like, just how special family can be. And when you hold them close, all the times, all the places, you know, Lazy Moe's, all these pub counter meals, everything that you would do with Sue, it was just so special. Every single time you would enjoy yourself because Sue had this very outgoing personality and very warm, kind-hearted spirit, you know, aurora about her. You know, there was this aura of... Sue, this this positive, happy, outgoing person, you know. And Sue, Sue will never get forgotten. We will, we will never forget her. She'll never be forgotten. And even in the hardest times, you know, you still live on in her memory. And that hurts so fucking much because you never wanted to because you, you wouldn't have, you don't you don't ever want to live on in, in their memory because they should be here to live in their own memory you know to be to be themselves and still be here but this message goes out to all right that Sue was as perfect as a mother that you could get she was such such on the key, perfect fucking cook. I'll tell you that, right? Really like master chef, even more than master chef level cook. She loved her diamond arts. And she loved her kids and she loved her family. It's just, yeah, it's fucking, I hate this so much. You know, John's lost without his mum. So is Jasmine and, and Tom, you know, it's just... Everyone's just lost without her. And you go day by day and you try and live on in her memory and that's more easier said than done, of course it is. But you try your hardest to live every day for her, you know? To keep the family going, to keep everything going in her memory. I'd like to say that it gets easier, but it never does. It never gets easier. It's more like the longer time goes on, the more it hurts. Because it's the more time you've had without that person, without hearing their voice, without seeing them, you know, without their presence. You know, it's like you just sit there and you just want to see Sue walk through the door. You know, or you want to just, you know, be able to get a phone call and say that your mum's coming home. But she's not, and, you know... So heart-wrenching as well when um, she left in the front passenger seat of, a, of the CHR and then she comes back in the front passenger seat of, of the CHR, you know, but in an urn. We never, never thought when I saw Sue in that front passenger seat of her car, leaving the property with Tom, that the next time that was going to happen, she was going to be in an urn. Like a week or so later, she's going to be coming back, but in an urn. It's, 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 you know, it's same position, front passenger seat of a car, but the urn. Just come on. That's so bad. You know. And if I could speak for John and Jasmine, it would be pain. Heartache, pain. You know, you had your mum pulled, ripped, pulled away from you. St stolen from you. You know? 
One. Life's never going to be the same again. Because you just... Beautiful woman just been stolen, ripped away from the world. She's only 62. You know, I know that everybody dies eventually. But you still got so much life at 62. You still still got, you know, years ahead of you still. You know? Like, you don't die at 62. You can still be like 80. You can even reach your 90s if you're lucky. And at least you know that you've lived somewhat of a full, fulfilling life. Right? I'm not saying that it would have been, you know, any better if Sue had died at the age of 90. Like, in terms of, it still would have hurt. But at least you know that she would have had a full life, practically. Not be just ripped away at 62. She would have had, If she had died at the age of 90, she would have had so many more years with Rosie. So many more years with everybody. You know? So many more memories. So many more happy times. Everything. And I say life is what you make of it, but it's only what you make of it. You only go so far when you've had someone so special just ripped away from you, you know? I remember this time last year, um, 4.25, yep, we were at the hospital. I think by this time too, we, we would have got told around about this time or something like that, that, um... Yeah, she wasn't going to make it. I mean, we, we sat down in the room and even said, you know, heart issues and stuff we didn't even know about. <sighs> this, this time was so slow but so fast at the same time. You know, everything just sort of, it's like time stood, stood still in a way. Because... You know, I just think about it right now, you know, I can still remember it as if it happened yesterday. And we're in the room and we're all just huddled around her hospital bed. And you could see the life fleeting from her. And even when she got read her last rites by the priest, and Jasmine said that she saw her mum, like mutter something, like try to talk or something like that. Jasmine said when she was getting read her last rites, as if she knew or she's trying to say something from what Jasmine told me now I, I didn't notice it but Jasmine said that she did she noticed that her mum was trying to utter some words underneath the mask when that priest was in there reading Sue her last rites it's like she knew and you know I Hoping that she didn't go in pain. And Tom said she didn't go in pain, which is... You know, you, you never want him to go in pain. Yeah, it's just a difficult thing for me if I was in Sue's position to say, would I want to be told that I'm dying or not? Would that add stress levels? What would that do, you know? Would, would you want to know? It's very difficult. It's very difficult to say. And we're just sitting there in the hospital room right now. And, um, you know, we're, we're just there, there for, you know, giving her all this love. And, um, you know, still talking to her and stuff, you know. Still letting her know how much we love her. And, yeah, just, you know, and then, um... One of the most bizarre moments in my whole life. So Jasmine's in the ICU room two hours after Sue passed away. And I'm trying to, you know, be there for Jasmine and everything and everyone, right? But I'm going in there and I'm, I'm trying to be there for Jasmine. And then I walk out and the whole ICU just forgets what their job is. Because they're all idolized by Rosie. And it got it got scary there for for a bit because I'm like, they're starting to get a little like, too 
you know, overly obsessive of Rosie. You know, because they were sort of like hotballing her at one stage. You know, one wanted to hold her one minute, and then the other one wanted to hold her another minute. Like, it's getting to be scary. I had to fucking... I had to keep... I had to monitor that situation, because I'm like... This is weird. You know, I had to just walk out and make sure that nobody was actually going to steal my daughter, because it was getting a bit scary out there. And then... Still be there with Jasmine. But the only reason why I gave Rosie to the uh, one of the ICU people, right... Was because I tried to be there for Jasmine, because she was just hugging into her mum, you know? It's one of the hardest things to try and be there for everybody. You know, you try and be there for your partner, you try and be there for your brother-in-law, you try and be there for your father-in-law. Like, you try and be there for everybody, and, and, you know, you always feel like you're going to be stepping in on somebody's toes, disappointing somebody at the end of the day, you know? And I just try my hardest even now, you know? When Jasmine or John or even Tom opens up about Sue, you know, I just want to hear, you know, I want them to open up, I want them to talk about her, you know? But one, one, one year ago today was just the worst day. Worst day. And every year it's going to be like this. And every year I'm going to do a video. Whether it's me literally just repeating myself every year, I don't care. I'm going to always do a, a talking video for Sue. You know, a tribute anniversary or commemoration or whatever it's called. I think I completely just botched that pronunciation on that word, but um, yeah. Now, Sue, we all love you. We all miss you so much. We all wish you would just walk through the door and everything would be fine, you know? Yeah, th this is for Sue and... Um, I'm also going to be adding uh, two new songs suggested by John uh, to Sue's music tribute video. So, yeah, um, and we're going to, uh, Saturday, not Friday, I'm sorry, Saturday, this Saturday we're going to go to Lazy Mo's in Melbourne and have a celebration of Sue's life dinner. You know, just, just to celebrate her life and remember and look back on her and and just remember it, all the good times, you know? Because unfortunately, that's all you have now. It's just the memories of all the good times. Yeah, um... Thank you for watching this video of, um... Sue's one-year anniversary or commemoration. I can't pronounce the word. The title may change if I get the right, but yeah, just one year of, of Sue I've been gone. Uh, so, um, as always, um, if you're not videoing it, you should be. And, um, yeah, take, take care, guys.